recording. Yes. So good to see you, Boston, once again, and everyone joining us. Um, the Bible says something very wonderful in the book of Ephesians 1 6. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. The first thing I want to say is that God is not a God of abandoned projects. God abandons nothing that he does. He, ab he abandons nothing that he starts. He always finishes what he started. There is no unfinished business in God. There's no unfinished work when it comes to God. God is not a variable. God is a constant. We are often the variable. If we draw a map of our activity with God, lots of times it's zigzag up and down. But if we draw a line of God's activity and commitment to us on a graph, it's a straight line. It's always a straight line. He never wavers. There are so many scriptures that talks about him being, that says there is no variableness. And there is no shadow of turning or variableness in God. God is not varying. His love for us doesn't vary. It doesn't go up and down like this. It doesn't change. It, it's, it's so consistent. It's amazing, but we're the ones who vary, you know, in our trust, in how much we trust him, in how much we, we love him, in how much we want his plan, in how much we trust in his plan for us. And that's important to know because it gives us confidence every time we go astray or every time we make a mistake or every time we tend to um, not trust him enough to understand that he's always there waiting on us he's always there uh, uh, um, with open arms ready to receive us because he never wavers his love never wavers so God abandons nothing that he he does that he starts. He always finish what, finishes what he started. There is no unfinished work in God, no half-made or forsaken projects, projects in God. God doesn't get frustrated and abandon his work in the middle of the road as men do. So men may leave us. Men may walk out of our lives. The, the people may do just whatever they like, but God is consistent. That scripture says, being confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in us is able to complete it. Three things I want to try to address today is what, how, and why. Being confident about what, that he who began the good work can, is able to complete it. So how can we be confident? And why should we be so confident that God is able to finish what he started so we can act on it? Because when you are convinced about something enough, you act on it. Lots of times when we have doubts, it's because we are not fully persuaded. That if I ask you, um, what's your name? And you say your name is Annie or your name is Bosun or your name is Chika or your name is Yemi. And I start to doubt that that's your name or that's who you really are. Most likely you would, if you feel like you, you probably laugh at me and walk away. Or otherwise, if you really feel like I'm somebody you need to convince, you might bring out your ID or something. But most times, you're just going to laugh. Like, <laughs> what do you mean I'm not Boston? What do you mean I'm not Chica? What, what exactly do you mean? That's because of how sure you are that that's who you are. That's because of how certain you are that that's who you are. Now, there is a certainty that comes from knowing who God says you are that makes you act on it. I'll say it like this. When you are convinced enough that you are who God says you are, you're going to act on it. Because he's the creator of heaven and earth, right? He created everyone. He created you and he created me. And I don't know a manufacturer who doesn't know his product. 
who who has asked somebody else about something he created. I don't know a manufacturer, maybe Nissan, Mitsubishi, or, or the, the car manufacturers who would finish manufacturing a car and has to ask questions about people. What do you think? I really don't know this car. If you made it, you know it. You know how it works. So God made you. He knows how you work. He knows everything about you. And it's so intentional. He intentionally made you and designed us different from one another, from each other, because he, he had a separate plan for each and every life that he created. Glory to God. So he said in his word in Ephesians 1 6, that's what we're trying to unpack today. He being confident that he which began the good work in us is able to perform it until the day of Jesus. So the first thing there is confidence, what or in what and how and why. Why, which he which has begun. This was first of all, you have to realize it's important for us to realize that. This was God's idea, not yours in the first place. Your life in the first place was God's idea, not yours. Your purpose, your gifts, your calling, your talents, your abilities were not your idea in the first place. It was God's. Your success was not your idea in the first place. It was God's because he said when he created man in the book of Genesis, he said, be, multiply. He says, be fruitful. That's what he said as a commandment to man. Be fruitful, multiply, and have good success. So your idea to want to succeed didn't start with you. It was God's idea. We tend to take things that God has given us so personal as if it was our idea in the first place. You know how you give a kid a little biscuit and a, a, a cookie or something, and then when you do want to have some, you say, can I have some? They don't want to give it back to you. And they kind of forget that if you hadn't given to them, they wouldn't have it in the first place. That's how we are with God. Your life was not your idea in the first place. We tend to take things that God has given us so personal as if it was our idea in the first place. It was God's idea for you to succeed. It was God's idea for you to have dominion. We are, you are doing God's will by having dominion and success in your sphere or in your industry. And you are bringing him pleasure by doing that. So this scripture says, he which had begun, it, which means that it's he who started it. That's the first line in that Ephesians 1, 6. He which had begun. It was his idea. It is his purpose. Therefore, it's his pleasure. Glory to God. If it is his purpose, it's his pleasure. I, I, welcome to everyone that's joining us right now. If it is his purpose, it's his pleasure. I'm going to re repeat that again. If it's his purpose, then it's his pleasure. Because if, 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 if my, uh, we have two Kia cars made by Kia. If any of them is not functioning or not working, then it's not bringing pleasure to Kia. Because what Kia wants to see is that we use it, we like it, and we tell somebody else about it. <laughs> What God wants you to see is to enjoy your life in God, love it, and to be able to tell somebody else about Jesus. Psalm 35, 27. It takes pleasure in your prosperity. God is not a God of rules and regulation. He's not a robotic God who has no passion, no pleasure, who is just all about uh, um, just whipping you when you make mistakes and doesn't care about your life no that's not who god is he is a good god he is good he's a good father anyone who will make such beautiful trees and oceans and such great things and put man in the middle of it is a good god and guess what it takes pleasure in seeing your life turn out good praise god 
So that scripture, uh, for those just joining us, we're talking about, we're considering today Philippians 1, 6. Be confident of this very thing that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it. Another version says, will perfect it. <laughs> Glory to God. He will perfect it. Not just perform it, but perfect it. Notice that he calls it a good work. Good work. A good work, my God. Any work that God begins is a good work. Why? Because God is good. His works are good because he is good. You know, when you take a blue pen, when you write on paper with a blue sharpie, what you get? Blue ink. The writing is blue because the pen is blue. The same way a good God doesn't produce bad works. Because he is good, his works are good. Even when it looks bad, it is working for our good. He is the rock, his work is his works are perfect. His ways are just. The psalmist David said in many places, in many instances, thy works are good. He even says God is good to all and his loving kindness is towards all. So, unpacking that, he who has begun a good work. So, first of all, we're establishing that it is a good work. Whatever God is doing in your life, you might not understand it, but it is a good work. It might not look good right now, but it is a good work. It might look all chaotic and you don't understand it. It doesn't seem to have any shape right now, but it is a good work. Thank you, Jesus. And then he says, he which had begun a good work in, in you will perform it. Uh, King James Version says we perfect it. Other Version says we'll we we'll perform it. Other versions say we'll perfect it. And, then, and now, let's look at this. One thing that's puzzling to me is that it is a good work, okay? It says it's a good work. And then it says he will perfect it. Because sometimes a good work doesn't always look good in the beginning. Sometimes a perfect work doesn't look perfect in the beginning. My goodness. So something he calls, he already says good work can be very well in an imperfect state which means is not which would mean practically means is not defining it by its present state when he says a good work it's not defining it by a physical appearance when he says good work <laughs> because he knows the end is the god who knows the end from the beginning it might not look like much right now, but it's what God says it is. It's good work. It might not look good, but it's good work. It might not look perfect, but it's perfect work. Because it's God at the center of it all. We know the definition of the good and bad in the worldly or earthly context. What's the definition of good and bad? We know it. What's the definition of good and bad in a godly context? The definition of good and bad in a godly context when it comes to God, one thing to know is that it is never based on present appearance. Something might look bad and God calls it good. It's because he knows the end from the beginning. <laughs> Glory to God. I always use this example. There are different kinds of games, right? There's soccer, there's golf and all of that. You got to know um, how to read the scoreboard of any game you're following because that's very essential. Football or baseball and all of that. The way, the way we know the game is we know who's leading, who's, who's winning, who's losing. We know we can follow the score lines. So we know how, what the scoreboard says. But there are, there's a particular, there's some particular kinds of games that the scoreboard, if you don't understand how to read the scoreboard, you won't be able to follow the game. So, for example, in soccer, if you see a scoreline of 3-1, then you know the team with three is winning and the team with one goal is the losing team. But when in golf you see 3-1, it's totally different because some games record the number of losses, just the number of wins. So it's inverted how they are rated. So... When you don't, so you just can't transfer your knowledge of soccer to golf. Because when you get on a golf course, you're going to be cheering the wrong team. 
you're going to be clapping for the wrong team. You're going to be supporting the wrong team because you don't know how to read the score line. My goodness. When it comes to God, you have to understand that the score line is not the same thing as the score line of the world. There are times that some things look like losses, but it's actually wins when it comes to God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There'll be times some things look like you're losing the game, but you are actually winning the game because it's not recording your losses, it's recording your wins. My goodness. And if you don't, if, if you don't know it, you'll be reading the score line the way the world reads the score lines when it comes to things of God. You can't read the score line, the scoreboard of God like the scoreboard of the world because it's going to look like you're losing. But sometimes when it looks like you're losing, when it comes to God, you are actually winning. What looks like a loss, sometimes when it's God, is a win. Glory to God. And I feel like we should take a minute and celebrate that because God is doing something amazing. God is doing wonderful things right now. And it doesn't look like a win, but it's a win. It doesn't look like, it looks like a loss, but it's actually setting you up for victory. Glory to God. So you got to understand how to read the scoreboard when it comes to God. Some people walk out of your life and it looks like a loss, but it's actually a win. Some people have walked out of your life in the past and you thought it was a loss, but it was actually victory because that's what brought you to where you are today. Anybody uh, appreciating God for what, what we're talking about right now? So the definition of good and bad when it comes to God is not based on appearance. Thank you, Jesus. Sometimes the person that has the least numbers <laughs> is the winner when it's God. They're recording because it's recording your, your wins, your, your, your wins when the world is recording your losses. My God, what the world records as loss, he recalls it as win. <laughs> so my goodness that's exactly who god is thank you jesus so the definition of good and bad when it comes to god one thing to know is that it's never based on present appearance number one he's not defining things by the present state or appearance number two is not looking at it through the lenses of human reasoning god sees what we see but he doesn't see how we see it God sees what we see, but he doesn't see it how we see it. A good work may not look like good in the beginning. A, a good work may first have a, a, an initial bad appearance. But when God is in it, it doesn't matter how it started. <laughs> it's going to end good. It doesn't matter how it began. Oh, yes. That scripture again says, he who began being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun the good work... <laughs> in you. Uh, it doesn't matter if it begins looking bad, but it is good work. It doesn't matter if it looks, it has a bad appearance, it looks chaotic and like everything is out of sorts, but he who has been confident in this very thing, that he which has begun the good work, that's what he calls it. Learn to call things what God calls it. He says it is good work, and then it, it's nothing else but good work because God says it is good work. The Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And listen to this. And the earth was without form and void. Spirit of God moved. Genesis 1, 2, 3. 1 verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. It was without form and void. It was shapeless. But the spirit of God moved in a situation that was without form and void in the darkness. Void meaning an empty space without nothing to hold on to. The spirit of God moved. <laughs> I want to let you know God is moving right now, even though it doesn't look like it's God. But God is moving. The spirit of God is moving. Oh, glory to God. His spirit of God is moving. It might not look like it, but it's moving. Thank you, Jesus. I said the spirit of God moved. And if God moved in darkness, in the void, in the middle of nothing, and said, let there be light. Anybody hearing what I'm saying? He said, let there be light, Thank you, Jesus. And there was light. Why won't God be able to move in your little situation? 
And listen to this. When God said, let there be light, there wasn't anything that existed before light. Light was the first thing that he created before anything else. All we ever really, ever really need is light. All we ever really need is to be able to see. Because light was the first thing. It was chaotic. It was dark. It was void, without form. And you think that God will start in a different way. But the first thing he does is light. Every time we're in a confused situation, we're in a terrible situation, we're in a chaotic situation, the first thing God is interested in is, is illuminating your mind to see it in a different way. Sometimes you think you're seeing it, but you're not really seeing it the way God is seeing it. So he brings you light to see it the way he sees it. God's perspective is always different from the world's perspective. It says, let there be light. And that was the first thing he ever, ever really did. All we really ever need is light. Some things are not really bad. We're just the ones who see them as bad. There's nothing. There is, there is something called divine illumination. It gives it comes through revelation. When you are divinely illuminated, you begin to see things differently. You begin to see things differently. That's when you can rejoice. That's the reason why you can rejoice when everybody is sad. <laughs> because you have a different, you, you, you have a divine illumination. You're welcome, Sister Bimbola. Good to have you. You have divine illumination. That's how come you can rejoice when everybody is sad. Because you have the light of God inside of you. You are seeing things, thank you, Jesus, the way God sees it. That's what it means to have divine illumination, to see, to have the light of God. God said, let there be light. Now, listen to this. Before then, nobody had seen light. Nobody knows what light looks like. Nobody knows what light looks like. He alone knew what he was talking about when he said, let there be light. Most of us, most of the time we pray, we refer to things God has done before and ask him to do it again, quoting scriptures. We're asking God to part the Red Sea as he did for the children of Israel. We're asking God to break down the wall like he broke down the wall of Jericho. God can do, that. that's, that's all right. God can do again what we've seen him do before. But how about the things we have never seen him do before? Because when he said, let there be light, and all through the creation story, let there be this, let there be that, he wasn't really doing something we had seen before. He wasn't doing something we had seen him do before. What does that tell us? He is God both when there's precedence and when there is no precedent. He is able to do exceeding. He is able to do abundantly, exceedingly abundantly, far above we could ever ask or dream or imagine, both in the precedented and the unprecedented. He's as much as the God of the precedented, as much as the God of the unprecedented. He's, let's not limit him only to the precedented. He says, behold, I do a new thing. Right now, he's doing something new in your life that's unprecedented. So don't put God in a box because he is a God outside the box, outside of the box. So there are things that God may want to do that's unprecedented. And if, we, if we're only towing the line of the precedented, we are going to miss it because it's not going in the conventional lane. God is a disruptor. Sometimes he changes things in very unconventional ways. Sometimes he moves things around in very unconventional ways, not the way we thought. He does, he does what we want, but not in the way we want him to do it, or not in the way we thought that he was going to do it. That's because he's a God that has no limits. There is no limit to his power. So that scripture says, um, and I'm finishing up, it says, being confident of this very thing, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work don't never ever ever forget that it's a good work and it's where in you my goodness it doesn't only say for you uh, and all it says in you that means it begins from inside of you it begins right from the inside it begins to change your heart it begins to change the way you think it's 
inside. We are inside out people. God may not change your situation. Lots of times he doesn't change your situation before he changes you. He changes you first. And then you begin to see a change in your situation. He that has begun the good work in you. It starts inside of you. Glory to God. And he would perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The beginning of a good thing may look chaotic. But he that which has begun the good work in you, it doesn't matter how it looks right now. What makes it a good work is not how it looks, but who is in charge. And then he says he will perform it. He will perfect it. So he's, he's perfecting it. It doesn't have to be perfect for it to be God. It doesn't, matter, it, it doesn't have to be perfect for God to be in it. Because many of us think that we have to be perfect, our lives have to be perfect, then we can invite God in it. <laughs> but if, if that's the case, then he has nothing to perfect in us. He has no project to do. He has nothing to work on. You are just the right candidate for God to embrace right now. You're just the right candidate for God to love. You're just the right candidate for God to help. You're just the right candidate for God to help out. You're just the right candidate for God to pick up. You're just the right candidate for God to assist. You're just the right candidate for God to perfect. If there's anybody here who thinks they're not perfect, that doesn't make you unqualified. It makes you qualified because God is looking for the imperfect. It doesn't call the perfect. It perfects the call. It doesn't call the qualified. It qualifies the called. I don't care what it looks like. It's a good work. It doesn't matter what it looks like right now. It's a good work. It's a good work. It's a good work. When he was, he was um, trying to heal the sick, he spat on the ground, put sand in the eyes. And it looks like, what do you, why do you do that to a, to, you can't even do that to an eye that is good. Not much, how much more the eye that is blind. <laughs> But he was perfecting it. He was perfecting it. And when sometimes it looks like God is perfecting something, it looks like he's getting messed up. When he told Moses to put his hands in his pocket, when he was, oh, he, he was teaching Moses and Moses was going to go to Egypt, the hand was withered at first. But he told Moses to put the hand back in the same place. Glory to God. There's so much revelation in that. We can't get into that. But in the same place, in the right place, he brought it out and the hand was made perfect. Sometimes when God is trying to do something new, something beautiful, it looks imperfect in the beginning. But it doesn't matter how it looks, God is doing a good work. That's why he then says, being confident in this very thing. Philippians 1.6, being uh, confident in this very thing. What is that very thing? That he which has begun a good thing, first of all, is a good thing. Secondly, it's in you. It starts within, not without. And then he will perfect the good thing. So the fact that it's not perfect doesn't mean it's not a good thing. Glory to God. 